um, I'd like to um, start with introductions, you know, just a limit of two minutes. We're going to have a very structured call so that we don't go on for two hours. Right. I, I'm going to mostly listen. And I know, and you, you have, okay, let's see where we're going. Okay. Is Susan, is Barbara coming on? I don't know. Okay. I didn't have any time to ch go, you know, reach out and see. And she didn't respond. So um, I think we should just get started. Okay. So let's start with introductions uh, in order of who came on first. Who's on first? <laughs> What's on second? <laughs> and um, to keep things moving, I'm going to mute everybody while and give everybody two minutes to introduce themselves. Okay. Yep. All right. So we're going to start with Lorenzo, and the clock is ticking. Um, I'm a curious guy, uh, a little bit too curious, I think, sometimes. But uh, I discovered, I made a lot of discoveries over the past 20 some odd years. Um, a, a really deep focus on the destruction at the World Trade Center and on the uh, airborne sorties in Manhattan and also on the Pentagon. So it's mostly focused lately on the destruction of the World Trade Center. That's that's pretty much me. All right, great. All right, and um, I'll just, I'm gonna mute you now. Um, I. I'm in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I've been involved uh, with the 9-11 movement um, since about 2007. Um, I'm uh, uh, with the um, Boston 9-11 Truth um, and Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. Um, and I also worked on the Citizens Campaign Commission, um, which was a ballot initiative in Massachusetts in 2012. Um, that's, and professionally, I'm an accountant, um, not a CPA. I just kind of worked myself up there. I started with an art background and segued into numbers. <laughs> I, I like reconciling. I like accounting. Um, and, and I still love art, but I don't do it anymore. I just collect it <laughs> and go to museums. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, it's been part of my life to um, get truth and justice, um, part of my heritage. So there we are. And uh, next up um, will be Jane. Okay, I'm a, a, a Air Force brat. My dad was in for 32 years, 34 years. He was a retired colonel in the Air Force. He was a navigator and a, and a bombardier and a pilot. And uh, so we've been all, everywhere pretty much. I've got an undergraduate degree in uh, nutrition and biochemistry. I've got a graduate a master's degree in biochemistry and biophysics. And I've got a law degree uh, from the University of Idaho. We, we actually grew up in Boise, Idaho area. Uh, so I love the Northwest, uh, but I'm in Texas now and I've adjusted to that because my parents said it was too cold up there. So they all stayed here and you stay where your parents are usually. So I'm a practicing attorney in Texas now and trying to retire, but not doing too well. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been studying the, this since 2014. Uh, I guess the lawyers are a little bit light here coming uh, up with uh, understanding what happened on that day. Cause uh, I swallowed it hook, line and singer the first, uh, the, no, you know, I really didn't because the Bush administration, I know how crazy they are. So I really didn't necessarily swallow it. But, you know, listen, the media is convincing. Uh, you know, you you think this one guy in a cave somewhere did this damn thing. 
and then until you start realizing it doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think I I should have woken up sooner because I've been studying the JFK uh, uh, assassination for over 40 years and have been and known all the main researchers for that. And I should have known better. But I didn't. So we didn't start uh, the lawyers committee until 2000. I think we incorporated in 2015, late 2015. Thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. All right. And sorry, Alan, I should have had you come on next because you joined us before Jane. So um, unmute and tell us a little bit about yourself. You're still muted. All right. My name is Alan Abrams and uh, oh, I, I kind of became involved uh, serendipitously, sort of by location and uh, and uh, where I was in 9/11, and then watching things unfold, and obviously seeing things contradictory within hours of their own news reports, and the narrative get shaped, and um, you know, to kind of put it down, and I got a job at Cornell and ran into some other information, Sarah did, uh, just kind of through where I was working and who I was working with, and and it bothered me some more. <laughs> so I, I've, I've been looking into the information, and uh, finally, good to see that there's actual um, white papers out there, whether or not they're um, accurately representing the data or not is, you know, just another interest of mine. Alan, I don't mean to interrupt you, but what do you mean by white papers? Regarding what? Oh, uh, oh. regarding, um, you know, you have uh, um, a whole bunch of uh, geological data from the United States that uh, was collected in the week and weeks after that was difficult to get through, get to without, a, you know, it's in a paywall academic paywalls a lot of times and um you know uh so i have to kind of wait until i can find it on the free uh <laughs> you know uh, where it's where i don't have to pay a, a, a subscription fee <laughs> embarrassingly enough and um um and then start looking through the data and actually uh, asking questions there, there's I have questions, uh, you know, they did certain reports and then there's, as I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to listen to Hans speak, actually. <laughs> On that <laughs> note, yeah. Because um, yeah. it's interesting to me, um, you know, in the most recent uh, communications I got from Hans with the information prepping to this, I see, I see um, some answers to questions I didn't have, I, I, so to speak, um, and uh, answers to questions I did have, uh, and but also raising more questions. You know, there's, there seems to be data missing or something. Uh, uh, they didn't go far enough. They had, they have the information, but they're not saying what is really there. I, that's just kind of. Well, we'll get into that as we move along. Um, mm -hmm. right now it's just introductions, but thank you. Uh, and, and, and now, Susan, I hate to interrupt too, but uh, Barbara's going to be on for five minutes, so I hope that we can um uh, give her time to get on before he's on starts. Okay, she, uh, she's going to want to hear. She's uh, right. uh, about five minutes away from her house. All right, um, well, I'm going to give Heinz two minutes to just a brief intro mm -hmm. introduction. And then Lorenzo's gonna do an overview for about 20 minutes um, and questions and answers, um, if anybody has any comments. And then Heinz is gonna do a presentation for about 10 minutes, okay? So Heinz, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're muted still. All right. Is audio good? Yes. Okay. So my name is Heinz Pommer. I'm calling from Germany. 
And I have a diploma in physics. And together with three colleagues, we wrote the book here, the Ground Zero Model. We did so in our spare time three years ago, just because the message seems to us of the utmost importance that 9-11 was a nuclear event. And although I never believed the official narrative for one single day, I did not recognize the nuclear nature of the event for more than 10 years until it was first formulated by Dmitry Kalesov. I knew immediately that Kalesov was both right and wrong at the same time, right about the nature of the event, wrong in respect to the dynamics and the missing radioactivity where he had no explanation for. So it took me some years to come up with a satisfactory explanation, a model which we all together nicknamed the Ground Zero Model or GCM. And that's it basically. Is your is your book in English? Oh, yes, it is. It. Yes, it is. It is okay. Well, here we go. I'm bobbleheading again. I'm going to go dark. <laughs> All right. Um. So thank you. Is that it uh, for your introduction, Heinz? Yeah, that's that is that's it. Yeah. Okay, and we have Barbara who just joined us. Um, Barbara, can you tell us, I'm gonna give you two minutes. Everybody <laughs> gets two minutes uh, you know, so that we don't have a two hour call. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. Okay, two minutes, huh? That's a yeah. big, that's You'll have more time later, but we want oh, to get into the any... presentations. I can do it in 20 seconds. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> You're limited to two minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. My, my time is starting now. Um, all right. Well, I'm Barbara Honiger, and I'm the chairman of the board of the Lawyers Committee for 9 11 Inquiry with Jane and our litigation director, Mick Harrison, and other attorneys, and Susan Serp is our treasurer. That's number one. Um, I've been a researcher, very serious researcher, activist, and public speaker, documentarian on 9-11 since the day of 9-11. Um, my major documentaries are Behind the Smoke Curtain, What Really Happened at the Pentagon and Didn't, and Why It Matters, um, and also the 9-11 Museum Virtual Walking Tour which unlike my first documentary I just mentioned covers all aspects of 9-11 and uses the actual exhibit items in the official museum at Ground Zero to prove that it's a huge big lie. And um, I've held high level positions in the US government, including in the White House, the Department of Justice and for uh, over 15 years, I was the senior military affairs journalist at the Naval Postgraduate School here in Monterey, California area where I live, which um, is still to this day billed as DOD's um, premier science technology and national security affairs graduate research university of the Department of Defense. So I think that's well, two minutes. Yeah, you got nine seconds, eight, seven. Oh no, <laughs> I'll fill it, I'll fill it. <laughs> no. All right, thank you. Well, let's get on with the- You didn't uh, say about your book. You you also have a book. Uh well, I've had more than one book, but my my most important and infamous or famous one, depending on your politics, is the October surprise or just October surprise on the deep story behind the Iran side of Iran Contra that uh, resulted in a full subpoena power House of Representatives investigation funded at the level of the nine eleven commission. All right, excellent. Okay. So now I'm going to mute everybody, and Lorenzo is going to give his 9-11 synthesis uh, presentation. Can't hear you. 
You're still muted. A little unmute then. All right, now that I'm back at the control screen, I can, I, I've unmuted and we'll share the 9-11 um, uh, Synthesis website. All right, uh, everybody see this? Okay. Um, I'd like to start with the, the one of the first discoveries that I made, actually, um, one of the first, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start right with Ground Zero uh, and talk about uh, what was uh, discovered when the uh, bathtub was cleaned out of all the, uh, you know, the steel and building materials and mentioned that there is what appears to be a subsidence, you know, like a, a falling down of what used to be smooth and level bedrock in two places under the location of each of the towers. Uh, uh, this one here is smaller. This one here is larger in diameter. There is a little bit of parallax and perspective or perspective involved, but uh, this one here uh, does really appear to be smaller where this one, you know, there's an implication that this circle of fractured, uh, this edge fracture here would continue around here where they have the uh, uh, planking done, the uh, planking at the bottom of the entrance uh, most likely because they needed to stabilize the surface uh, to use their heavy, get their heavy equipment in and out. Uh, this is the location of the uh, south tower. Um, you can see that there are men climbing down into this hole. Um, this section over here, where you see all this material that is, you know, going into a gully, a trough, is called a deep hole, and we'll take a quick look at that in the damage reports. Again, this is the uh, crater that we saw right over here. And it definitely appears to have you know, collapsed in on top of something. Uh, these are the damage reports. And this is, uh, this is twisted. This, this would be the, uh, the south over here. And this would be the north. Or well, you can see that there's a north-south over here. So uh, this deep hole is what we see over here, where my cursor is right now. Again, damage report. Now, uh, after uh, studying all the other theories, I just couldn't couldn't correlate uh, what I was seeing with anything but you know uh, explosive and mechanical events. And after discovering um, the cavities that we'll look at in a couple of seconds beneath building number four. Uh, I didn't know they were beneath number four. I thought that they were um, these cavities. I, said, I, I could see that there was a subsidence here, and I thought that maybe later they had excavated these two cavities. But the two cavities that uh, were beneath number building number four are over where I'm moving the cursor right now, on the other side of this slurry wall in this area right here. Uh, this is a, an animation I did after years of begging friends to do an animation. Uh, I have friends who do SolidWorks and could have done this. But this is uh, an animation of my theory, which uh, Barbara uh, understands pretty fully now, uh, that the nuclear event was uh, a thermonuclear event, or the events were thermonuclear. They were sized appropriately to do the work that they needed to do. And the work that I believe that they needed to do was to reduce the bedrock beneath the towers, creating a subsidence, which allows the core to uh, drop. David Cole on the uh, Richard uh, Gage Unleashed uh, a couple of days ago, everybody's looking much more at the motion, you know, the motion of the towers. And that is critical. And uh, along with the timing, the timing of the seismic events. Um, which uh, Richard presented so well that Andre Rousseau had uh, analyzed as events, you know, major seismic events occurring, uh, you know, 10 to 15 seconds prior before the collapse of each of the Twin Towers, uh, 2.1 for the South Tower and a 2.3 for the North Tower. So this image here shows uh, a nuclear, you know, it's an, it's an artist's rendition of what may happen in a thermonuclear reaction where the material in the center is vaporized. Essentially, the volume is 
I mean, it's turned into a gas. So it's no longer uh, a, a solid form that can, you know, keep everything away from it. And the heat produced uh, melts out to a certain radius. And the pressure produced during the initial uh, impulse of energy produces so much gas, so much vapor, uh, in increasing the pressure. So it would fracture um, the bedrock around it and, um, of course, above it. And that's, you know, high pressure always goes to low. And if you can find a way, um, as we noticed, there was actually venting that occurred from below uh, just prior to the collapse of each of the towers. The next illustration is um, the mechanics of it. The creation of a subsidence allows the core to uh, fall. Uh, and we'll look at a couple of videos that will support that. Uh, um, just, me. Uh, I just wanted to make one quick correction. It was Jonathan Cole, not David Cole. Oh, excuse, thank you, honey. Thank you. Jonathan Cole. I, I get right. all... You know, flustered and mixed up sometimes. Right. Thank you. John. That was that was a good interview, but still not. Uh, I'm, I'm still not in, in in resonance with a lot of the interpretations. And we uh, also have a request to uh, hang on to the, uh, the diagrams and screenshots that you're showing for about fifteen seconds. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So you uh, you you tell me. Uh, okay, you want me to time it? Are we good on this one? Yeah, we're good. Go ahead. You All got right. 13, 14 minutes. Okay. Um, this expresses the mechanics, uh, you know, what I believe to be the reason that uh, they used a device to reduce the bedrock beneath it, you know, the creation of a subsidence, in that the core was softened by uh, incendiaries, most likely during the day. People did hear explosions. You could see in uh, a couple of corners of the building that there was uh, what appears to be incendiary uh, melting of steel, uh, the orange uh, glowing molten metal that poured out. And we'll take a quick look at that in one of these just prior to the collapse, actually, of the core. So the reason that I believe this was done was to uh, pre-stress the fasteners between the trusses uh, and the perimeter columns and the core columns so that when the explosive top-down uh, dismemberment proceeds just after the collapse of the core, just that second, at the second that you see the core dis start to descend, you see the explosive dismemberment from the top down. Um, a quick video thirty six okay. oh there we go You can see that there's uh, molten steel pouring out of the corner. Uh, so there, uh, on these floors here, there was uh, incendiary charges uh, installed to sever the uh, connections between the uh, perimeter faces and the corner. That that uh, uh, that's a surmisation. It's. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, this is the moment when the corner uh, starts to slip. All right. Uh, did everybody notice the motion here? Yep. And, and that the uh, perimeter columns are being pulled in. So that correlates with the uh, uh, the animation, the second animation I drew. So at this point here, we really don't see any explosive activity up top. 
So motion, you know, again, what uh, Richard and uh, Jonathan uh, talked about last night was motion. So what I can surmise right now and through other videos is that you can see the uh, tower, you know, the antenna starting to drop up above. But this is showing you where the motion on the perimeter uh, started. And this is just prior to the what we'll see now is the explosive uh, sequential explosions from the top down to uh, displace all of this material, which has now been softened, uh, severed, and you know, ready to just blow away because they don't want it to fall down on top of something. They really, well, it's going to fall down on top of something anyway, but uh, you can't get much more dramatic than, um, than what we see next. All right, so there's a lot of material uh, that we can see coming down. I'm uh, going to go back to get out of this mode here. I'm going to stop share for a second. Actually, going to cl why am I not able to get rid of this? Oh, it's because it's a new window. That explains everything. Um, this is the same, the same detail. It's a, a, a GIF of the collapse, the, you know, of the, you know, the corner as it starts to slip. All right. Um, I have been so careful since I first discovered the uh, cavities beneath uh, building number four, which I didn't know where they were. Uh, and I, the minute I, the second I located, I may as well go right to the image. The minute, the first time I ever laid eyes on any of these uh, photographs, what came into my mind was they set off a thermonuclear uh, device in Manhattan uh, beneath the buildings. And for the longest time, I didn't know where this was. I thought that when I saw these holes, that they were the cavities, uh, the, uh, uh, that they were what we saw beneath the Twin Towers, the, the subsidence craters that they had excavated finally. So until uh, um, uh, a David Meiswinkle kind of poked me in a direction, uh, I had not paid attention to, I, I'd been looking for the location, trying to find that location to help me understand what's going on here. And this was uh, just totally startling because um, discovering the topographic, uh, the geotechnical mapping of the site uh, in the geological survey that described it as uh, Ice Age erosion, um, that this was what the site looked like after they had poured the slurry walls and they had excavated down to the bedrock. That's before they started flattening it to build on. And you can see that there are details here. This is what they call a till-filled valley. And everything, all these lines go up. All of these lines here go up in altitude, in, in, in height, from this lowest point that they measured to. Uh, they measured down to the till. They did not go any deeper than, than a, a loose fill that they found there. Um, this is the post-9-11 uh, geotechnical survey of the site. And it's really, I mean, it will, okay, let's move down here just so we see. You can see where it's located by these overlays. Um, the two cavities, one of them is located almost underneath the entrance lobby of building number four, and the other one is all located just slightly outside the east wall. And this is a detail of that site. Uh, this is sea level, that's 60 feet below, and that's 100 feet below. That's 80 feet below, or 20 feet below the surface, which is about where that bulge in is in the center of this cavity on the left. Uh, Probably the same thing existed over here before they started chipping away, and we'll get into those pictures in a second. Uh, these cavities are 40 feet from uh, the original surface to the bottom. Both of them very, very similar in depth. Uh, and this one here is an indicator that says whatever happened, happened right about here. Whatever charge was uh, set, was set right about here because the energy radiates out from the center and uh, vaporizes, melts, and fractures. Um, you can see that this fracture over here uh, resulted in what is called an upheaval because that 
uh, section of bedrock is now above the original surface, and this one here collapsed into the cavity. Um, again, the location, that's uh, just an understanding of topographics. Uh, just to let you know, you have five minutes left. All right, pretty close. The seismic evidence is really critical. Um, I appreciate Barbara um, uh, for working with Richard uh, in putting together a really good presentation on the timing. Uh, what would what I will surmise is the is as close to the actual timing uh, of the events according to the uh, local seismo se seismogra seismology. <clears throat> This is when the first aircraft struck the first tower around that time. However, this is not an indication of what occurred. This is actually seconds before the first aircraft struck the first tower. And you can see that they have a scale over here of 10. There is a, a sharp, a fairly sharp rise, but it's not a high rise. So it indicates uh, something that I would uh, imagine as being an amateur seismologist as something that is closer to the surface that would set the earth in motion in a trampoline rather than somebody banging on the wall, um, which we'll see later. Um, this is the event that I surmise occurred uh, beneath either one or both events simultaneously that occurred beneath building number four. But that's just speculation. That's just a theory right now. There's no nothing to prove it. Here's a sequence of pictures starting from before, you know, before they had fully cleaned out the steel. And you can see how much um, energy, how much heat there is down below because they're pumping water on this to cool it down so that people can work on it. So there's a lot of energy down below, a lot of heat being uh, stored uh, by whatever occurred um, on 9-11 down below the surface, way below the surface of the bedrock. This is one of the uh, two chimneys that were discovered in uh, beneath uh, building number four. And this is a picture of that chimney over here and a picture of the other uh, chimney, the other cavity over here. This is when they started to excavate beneath building number four. Uh, they're starting to chip away the overhangs. These are uh, chipping hammers on excavators. Uh, here's a uh, what appears to be steel or iron uh, pipe uh, that, uh, that is coming up at uh, the end um, of one of these cavities, and we'll see more of that later. This is one of the most striking uh, comparisons right here because it shows old, aged, weathered uh, face on uh, a cleft, you know, a crack in the bedrock that's been exposed to all of the elements that were able to reach it. You know, oxygen, water, you know, what's in water, you know, soluble in water. And uh, this down here, however, is a uh, totally different. Uh, color and texture. Um, and it also indicates the direction of the striations in the rock that uh, Manhattan just appears to have been upended during the formation of the earth so that its layers were no longer a strata in a horizontal plane, but became a vertical plane. This uh, shows where they're chipping away the over had chipped away the overhangs. This is fairly freshly broken. And you can see that there are people uh, hoeing away at this liquid, the slurry in the bottom, and cleaning up what they are uh, cleaning off the surfaces. You can see that this is a chipped surface over here, newly chipped. And you can see that this is a completely different form. And you can also see that there are these under, uh, you know, these overhangs and under you know, undercuts. Uh, and it's a spherical shape. The geologists even reported that they couldn't find any indication of flow. Uh, there's nowhere for any head to have occurred. Uh, in this region, any pressure, uh, velocity, volume of, of water to have moved and built up pressure to a, to a velocity that it could do uh, major uh, damage. And this is just uncovered. It, you know, it was not there before 9-11. So there's so many arguments that, that support this. Um, you have one minute. Okay. This is probably the picture that, that got me in the first place, the one that said, holy shit. Uh, look what they did. Look what they did. Um, that's pretty much it for this end of the presentation. This is the new building number four, by the way. Thanks, uh, Chris Joy, uh, 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 an interview we did with him a few years ago. Seven. For pointing that out. Building seven. Seven. You're good. <laughs> I was testing you. <laughs> <laughs>
There is a new building four on top of the site, by the way. Uh, they're uh, starting to put in the uh, foundations. You can see the work going on over here, over here, uh, down here, over here, putting in new uh, um, uh, foundations, uh, which are now attached to solid, solid bedrock. They could not have built on the site without excavating, and they really had to utilize the site. So this is this was the only cavity that was fully that was exposed the um substance craters beneath the twin towers are beneath each of the uh, memorial pools now and chris joya has been down there it would be really interesting to you know for you to approach chris and say what were you doing down there at some point but yeah thank you very much for uh, listening and um let's open it up to questions and comments yep. um who would like to go jane okay i would I like you to I'm, All right, I'm, like to, uh, I'm looking at this bedrock and I'm sitting here going, how do you get a nuclear device down there in that rock? Uh, because I think that, I mean, I, I'm trying to discern if, if we can explain an implosion by plain uh, dynamite or however they do it, however they implode a building, why do we need the nuclear here? Uh, how do we get the nuclear device in that rock? Yeah, that has uh, puzzled me for the longest time, and I have no answer for that. I do know how they could get the device down 20 feet. And there is equipment that uh, you can go to a number of hardware stores in the country and purchase uh, uh, compact diamond core drills that you can go down 20 feet uh fairly easily with. Or there may have been vaults underneath here, as some people have uh, mentioned, that uh, stored uh, precious metals and other things. Um, this may have been, a, uh, and they, 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 again, I, I don't like to talk too much about conspiracy stuff, but if there was evidence or lack of evidence that they wanted to hide uh, down here, then that may have been uh, the reason was to destroy. Yeah. The I don't know how big a nuclear device is, but I would assume if you have a solid rock there you'd have to drill into it oh absolutely and, and that would be kind of noticeable i'd think uh but well, if there were chambers that were there already for other yeah. purposes i guess i could understand that too and if if so then is there evidence to that effect that i'm not clear on the only thing that i've studied is the holes themselves uh this is for other uh freedom of information through you know getting design features of the building and finding out if there were vaults um again uh drilling a 12 to 16 inch uh, diameter hole with a diamond core bit down 20 feet uh, in the sub basement level of this you just need to come in with a pickup truck pretty much with a like a small drilling rig on it and uh you know spend a couple of days um you know taking out a, a core that you can drop a device into or well, not drop but place a device into could core that be done through a building easy. or huh could that be done through going through the floor of a building uh, they would have been in the basement a basement level. of a building. Yeah, it can be done. I mean, there are compact units, uh, vertical core drills that you just keep on adding sections to pull them out, remove the sections, uh, remove the core, and then go down and uh, drill deeper and remove the next section. So it, it's a multi, it's a multi step. They don't just do it in one step. Okay, and Barbara has a question. Okay. Well, I have on more than one actually. The first one is, um, thank you, Lawrence. And have you done? Um, you know, um, if, if you go, if you go back up where you did the, um, could, could you, and I'll tell you where to stop, keep going up, 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 up to your graphic, which shows the level above sea level. Stop there. Th okay. This, that right there. Have you done, have you done one of these for each of the two twin towers? Cause if so, it would be very valuable to see that. Well, okay, Barbara, the answer to that question is uh, the only uh, material that's available now uh, is the images of the uh, subsidence uh, craters in the location of each of the Twin Towers. So, they, we, so they don't have topo topographical maps for... They for may, them. but that's something that I have not been able to locate. Oh, okay, that's my question. Yeah. Without the topographical... Uh, no, that would be ge geotechnical, be geotechnical right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah uh, my next, I actually have a comment on Jane's comment or question, and that is, um, there are two ways that 
some kind of a nuclear device could be placed under any of the buildings. One of them is that they were placed before the buildings were constructed as part of the construction, um, which is what I favor. Um, but for the um, for the towers, my understanding from Per Berglund, who also has a model uh, like Han, Heinz uh, Palmer does, um, all of these models are slightly different from each other, but they agree that there were uh, nuclear devices uh, under the towers. Now, under the if I, if I understand correctly, in the bedrock under um, at least World Trade Center one two seven and now it appears also four maybe others um according to per berglund and i've been going back and forth with him um he he claims that there were wells uh already under the lower uh the lowest basement b6 level in for each of the twin towers yeah. so yeah. Yeah. That's a good possibility. Noticing that steel pipe in the area of building number four, there very well could have been uh, uh, core drills uh, already having been down there for a number of reasons. And the uh, future destruction, I mean, just thinking about this, um, they may, yeah, again, I don't get too much into, into the, the deep conspiracy, but it could well have been uh, planned well, you know, before the buildings were uh, planned, and that there were uh, receptacle, you know, uh, 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 drills, drillings for to receive uh, some uh, high explosives. Or uh, I, I tend to think that they didn't have that foresight, and that the drilling was probably done uh, after or during the time that uh, uh, Silverstein Properties took over the uh, the development. Um, could I make one other comment, Sue? Yeah, uh, since you prefaced it with two questions, I gave you four minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted I just wanted to mention uh, there's there's quite a bit of evidence actually um, that these buildings were um, pre-constructed with the ability to take them down, and that it was actually required um, by the um, the planning department of the city and by the um, the uh, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. That's number one. Number two, there's an interview that if you don't have already, it's in um, it's in uh, Heinz Palmer's book, uh, the Grand uh, Ground Zero Model, um, and he just sent it to me. I I couldn't get the link to work, but but in there um, there is a uh, an interview that um, a woman did um, who worked for a company that was trying to get a contract to do Giuliani's uh, emergency operations center. Their proposal was that it would be in the deep, in a deep basement level. It ended up being on the 23rd floor, which is ridiculous. But anyway, um, and uh, in this interview, she makes it clear that when they, on the afternoon of 9-11, around five, early evening, 520, 21, when they saw World Trade Center 7 coming down, everybody uh, from her company who saw it said, oh my God, they're lying about what brought it down because they knew they had seen the original blueprints that had the um, the places where the controlled demolition explosives would be placed if it needed to be brought down quickly. Heinz raised his hand too. What? So Heinz raised his hand, so I think he'll be going okay. next. Okay, good. Uh, since Heinz is going to give us another comment, I guess with Lawrence and with Heinz, I have it. I, I just have a really hard time believing, being in real estate at one time in my life, that anybody would bother to want to rent any property in a high rise if there's a feasibility that they have these things prepared ahead of time to destroy where these people are renting. I mean, that's, the, uh, that that's precisely the reason for the cover up, Jane. No, no, no. I'm saying if is that a standard type of uh, architect or or uh, engineering, uh, uh, you know, possibility? I mean, is that is a standard thing that engineers would do uh, for these uh, buildings? May I comment? 
Yeah, and I want Heinz to comment too, if he, if he can. Okay, he well, let, uh, let, Heinz had his hand up before, so I, I'm going to uh, relinquish my comment until we, you know, Susan's keeping this in order, and I must respect Lawrence, it. Lawrence, could you take your, your graphics off the screen? Sure. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. We'll get back to that at some point. Here we go. Okay. Um, you have just, uh, well, you have said a, a lot of correct things, but nonetheless, you have summarized the, let's say, my, my, my level of knowledge five to 10 years ago. So <laughs> I had with one of the co authors from this book um, a lengthy discussion and an exchange of, of ideas. And I finally recognized that these, these um, cavities in the ground are too far away. And I will send you a link with my precise evaluation and the recognition of my error. So the, the first part was the explosive event, the underground nuclear device, which was, uh, well, I would call it, I would like to call it a nuclear process. And uh, the second thing is these cavities which are in, well, I, I, I got into the same trap, so to speak, five years ago, and Francois, Francois Ruby, the co-author of this book, convinced me finally that these cavities were not related with the destruction process of the World Trade Center. But I'll send you the information. Could you send that to Sue so she can send it? To yeah, me? I will. Okay. All right. Alan, did you have any questions or comments? But but I didn't get Heinz to answer that question. Oh, he knows, oh, okay. Is this a standard practice to have these cavities available under high rises in the event that sometime in the future you want to blow them up? I mean, is that part of the construction of the whole project? Uh, That's what I was going to comment on. When it first starts? That's what Heinz, I was going to comment on. Two questions to Heinz. Oh. Uh, no. Uh, these uh, cavities, as far as I understand, are the uh, are of natural origin. That's the first point. The cavities we saw, not the cavities directly under the towers, under under tower one and tower two, but the cavities under building four are of natural uh, origin. So <clears throat> that apart, uh, of course, the building code in New York had the pres prescription that. Uh, the builder must come up with some sort of solution how to dismantle and build back the buildings. And in these times, indeed, uh, explosive methods were, well, thinkable at least. So I think that the towers one and two at least were at the beginning of the construction already prepared for dismantling and an explosive uh, demolition but not nuclear but not, but not nuclear but not nuclear uh, no no nuclear 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 from yes from the very beginning at the very start yes huh this is the okay. explicit yeah. claim of dmitry kalitov he claims this... from from inside russian intelligence then soviet yeah. intelligence this uh, is this is exactly what Kalisov also says, yes. Yes. But it but, fits. But, but Heinz, fits. Could, could, you, could you respond to Jane's question about, I think she was referring not to the cavities that I don't think that um, Lawrence was referring to, that, that you say are natural, but to the ones under World Trade Centers 1 and 2, under the central core. Well, this is a normal, um, a normal process after the... Um, I, I named the structure eruptive egg after the eruptive egg has uh, been emptied of its content. So when the granite has been blown out, uh, that the ground subsided a bit. This is a natural occurrence after such uh, such an event. You're so they are before, nuclear in nature. You're talking about before the construction of the tower now. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, these cavities were created after the uh, the demolition. But before construction, there were no cavities. There is, the blueprints are pretty clear. It's a flat granite surface. And the only thing which is a bit suspicious is a small well, a small pit 
right. in the blueprints. But there must also be a borehole which must have been added prior to construction, most likely. <coughs> a borehole down to the pit? A bore, no, a borehole from the pit down 75 meters in the earth. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, that in, that in diameter, not much. Any small drill could do. And so where would the nuclear device be placed? In the pit or down 75 feet? <clears throat> uh, we have a, a sort of insertion point, which is which is 19 meters above zero point and uh, an explosion point, which is, which is at zero point. And zero point is by definition, 75 meters below the rock surface. So that's where the device would have been. Uh, the explosion point. The explosion point, where the device would have been. And uh, 19 meters higher. 19 or 90? 19 meters higher from zero point. Zero but point meaning ground level? It's 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 getting clearer in in my video in my short presentation. Oh, we're, we're waiting for your presentation. <laughs> okay. Well, let me just say, uh, give uh, Lorenzo a chance to make any comments about what was just said uh, for a couple of minutes. Do you have anything? You know, um, Lorenzo, I can understand. Um, I can understand, Lorenzo, that that they, if you're saying that's true, that they prepare to dismantle uh, when they start to mantle, you know, start to, to build these buildings. But I can't even imagine they would conceive using nuclear, knowing what they know about it. And these, what would the, these were built in the 80s? 70s. 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 Okay. I mean, uh, you know, all right. uh, I'll make a couple of comments about process. Uh, and uh, there's a possibility that there were already holes there for whatever devices they decided to install uh, later. That okay. um, Project Plowshare is a, a really good resource to understand the you know uh, what Lawrence Livermore and uh, Los Alamos were uh, working on back in the 70s, uh, having to do with uh, peaceful use of uh, nuclear explosives for thermonuclear reactions, for reducing or um, you know for for fracking, for breaking uh, the earth down deep without having a vent. Uh, for a cratering or you know actually using the device to blow material up up away and out um there's some major uh, uh cratering uh, experiments done uh and for uh you know doing uh, longer craters or troughs or trenches um and project it, plowshare was in the 70s yeah so we're talking yeah. the same time period yeah, um, and it was basically devilifying nuclear devices for construction uses. Uh, okay. you know, for, you know, for for being able to move Earth uh, mm -hmm. in either down deep, alter it so that you could extract, you know, frack for gas. You fracture the material so that any natural gas that's um, um, you know, uh, sequestered in this in this under pressure in this rock could then vent out. One of the big problems is it vents wherever it can. And if there's a lot of cracks, you just, you can't contain the stuff. Yeah, uh, that was technology that was being uh, looked at uh, for, for creating underground reservoirs, for creating that cavity for building underground cities and habitat. So there's an awful lot of uh, studying being done using thermonuclear for altering the earth, um, the rock, um, for the betterment of mankind. Mm -hmm. okay. Alleged betterment. Heinz, okay. go ahead. I would just like to add there, on the nuclear front, there are two parties, so to speak. One party prefers to speak about a super modern nuclear weapon, which leaves no traces. And the other part, the other party is talking about old technology. Yeah. Kalisov does talk about old technology, and I myself talk about old technology, which is which was designed in the 60s and 70s, just to make that clear. Yeah. Okay. I'm talking about whatever they had that would do the job the way they wanted to, which, yeah. was, which was to produce the right amount of energy to do the vaporization and the melt, uh, which would form the... Again, building number four is a mystery, and I think the first thing that I came out when I came out was... They... 
Yeah, this is where the weird conspiratorial stuff comes in. And I, I used a phrase that they used during the uh, first and maybe the Second World War. Or maybe it was just as, if you got them, smoke them. You know, uh, they, here are all these talented and skilled uh, nuclear physicists with products that can do work um, in whatever form it is, whether it was for the uh, radiological um, shotgunning or whether it was for the formation of uh, a substance for the core to literally collapse into weaken, you know, causing the, the structure to be you know, compromised even more so that it would then be able to be blown apart. So we have two camps, which are the a radiological or the use of the, the the nuclear device as a radiological device that could do work or a thermal device uh, that can do work. Am I clear on that? All both. Uh, possibly both, both. Possibly yeah. both. I mean, yeah. we could see that a lot of the steel that came Let's out. Let's confuse everybody. Let's do both. <laughs> well, what you can see is that a lot of the steel that was being pulled out of these uh, cavities beneath the, you know, the the, uh, cr the subsidence craters beneath the towers were dripping. Uh, you, you heard a number of witnesses that were cleaning out the pits saying there was, there was steel running down the channel rails as they pulled the steel out from beneath the twin towers. Uh, and possibly building number seven. And uh, we don't know very much at all about building seven. That was a total secret from before the day of, you know, bef in, early in the morning, uh, uh, that building was under guard after it was, uh, ex after it was uh, evacuated. Well, Silver, Silverstein, something about Silverstein seven. owned seven. Silverstein only owned seven. He rented the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd like to say something about seven. That people may not know. Um, I've sent it multiple times to the lawyers committee and I can send it again to anyone who doesn't have it. But a guy by the name of Shapiro, who as I recall used to be a DA or a U.S. attorney, uh, who is a close friend of Larry Silverstein's, a close colleague of Larry Silverstein's, he actually published that he was on the phone with Silverstein as they were leading up to the collapse of World Trade Center 7 and Silverstein told him that um, they were going to uh, have to bring down that building because the um, the basement level, the, the lower level, had been so seriously compromised. Um, so that's important to know. I can send that. How to could that have happened? <laughs> yeah, right. In other words, parallel to World Trade Center 1 and 2 for sure. I wanted to give Alan a chance. Did you have anything you wanted to say, Alan? No? Okay. Susan, can we take a five-minute break before Hines starts his? Because I've got a dog that won't leave me alone right now. All right. Uh, <laughs> I got a little bit. breaks for everyone. <laughs> In my house. Okay. okay. So I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I sure would appreciate it. Just give me, give okay, we'll come minutes. back at uh, 5 0 a 505 Pacific, 805. Minutes. Yeah. Five minutes. <laughs> five okay. Minutes. Five minute break. Eight five. Anyone Eight that five. wants to hang out and oh, chat for that five them. minutes, is, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> High five. <laughs> I'm in my library. It's very cold here. <laughs> And I've got my pellet stove running really well lately. So I'm, I'm here in Massachusetts. It's still probably right around the freezing point. Does uh, a pellet stove have any toxic gases associated with it or not? Uh, it depends on what's in the pellets and where you're um, exhausting it. Hmm. If it's uh, well sealed and, and you don't have any exhaust gases, uh, escaping uh, the uh, flu pipe into your house uh -huh. there may be um, you know unburned hydrocarbons there probably are a fair amount of unburned hydrocarbons in the pellet exhaust but the, the one that i have now is actually operating better than it has in the past 15 years so the only heat from the pellet stove is from the metal of the actual stove radiating is that right heat no it um it's a radiant out through the glass uh, it's convection, uh, it has convection uh, a blower that uh, moves air, you know, the basement air through a, a heat exchange that runs behind the fire board, you know, the board behind the uh, fire chamber, the burn chamber. 
Okay. So the, you know, the uh, combustion, uh, the combusted gases go up and they're moved forward in the stove and then they go across and then down uh, behind uh, where the uh, fire is and then exit at the bottom of the stove out the uh, left hand side of the stove. Uh, where so the a, gases are not coming out, just heated air. Yes, that's correct. Similarly with my rocket stove, mass heater. Rocket stove? <laughs> yep. Is that nuclear? I hope not. <laughs> no, no, it's um, a biofuel. Oh, biofuel. What kind of bio? In this case here, uh, a red oak chips, uh, red oak splits, um, maple splits, um, all fairly small because the stove is so efficient. I have a very small a burn compartment in it and I'll put uh, you know maybe uh, less than a you know less than a square less than a half a square foot of fuel in it every hour or so. Lawrence are you I've been I've stayed overnight for two or three nights in Sue's house where you live are you in that upper room that we're looking at what, what room are you in? Oh uh, where I am right now? Yeah. Uh, this is my uh, living room uh, in my home in Hudson. Oh Hudson okay. All right, and who is the babe behind you on the wall? Oh, uh, my, <laughs> that is uh, my one of my old roommates, uh, Charles really? Co. Charles Co. Uh, went to Russia in the late seventies, and that is a pinup calendar of a <laughs> of a Soviet uh, a woman. A very, really? Yeah. <laughs> he gave it to me. That was outside my recording studio uh, <laughs> door for the longest time. Uh, and it was down the basement until just recently when I resurrected it and brought it back up here. And it was for Charles because I wanted to take a picture of it for him. Uh, <laughs> That's and funny. So I shared it on his timeline. So where is Hudson? Is that in Massachusetts? It's Metro West Massachusetts. It's uh, uh, between 495 and 128, uh, closer to 495, closer to the outer belt. And uh, between uh, the Mass Pike and Route 2. Uh, just you know, really close to the uh, post, you know, the, the postal route which runs, uh, you know, Route Twenty, which runs across the country. It's uh, you know, US Twenty. Okay. I'm very close to US Twenty. Well, it looks like you've got it very well organized there. Oh boy! Don't ask Susan. <laughs> <laughs> well, compared to mine. <laughs> Well, it's this is a room that I use fairly frequently. Uh, I get to jam with people all over the world on Saturday night uh, on the internet with uh, some of the new applications that have extremely low latency to the point where you, it's almost undetectable. Um, hmm. It's just a wonderful experience to be able to sit here and not have to move equipment and get to play with people. Hmm. Interesting. You might want to mention how many instruments you play. You've been a musician for 50 years. Um, guitar, vibes now, um, keyboard, flute, saxophone. Okay, sax, flute, bass, guitar, keyboard, percussion, vibes, and now harmonica. You're a whole orchestra. <laughs> well, I get I get to play one at a time. <laughs> but with multi-track, you can mess around and, and uh, compose. Yeah, with multi-track, you could be all of them together. I've done a fair amount of work with a multi-track. It's been, I've got a fairly good uh, catalog of stuff back there. I, yeah, and I really enjoy writing and I have enjoyed writing in the past. Uh, I still enjoy playing the music that I've written, but I haven't I think done we're much. we're still writing. waiting for Jane, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. She's on dog time. Yeah. Here she you is. Gotta go, you got to go up here. Okay, I'm back. Here she is. <laughs> In that beautiful right. office of yours. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, Heinz, you're on. All right. And you can share screen. All right. Um, if you, Susan, if you could just start with the link I, I have given you. Oh, dear. Um, I'm going to have to try and find that. Hold on. Heinz, do you have the... Um... Uh, material there that you can share screen with so that you're in full control? Uh, well, I'm not sure. I'm, I might try. Yeah, I looked Susan at the slideshow. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, not a slide, this, the, the, the video. The pre-recorded. Yeah. Okay. Pre yeah. pre I, I did send you one hour ago. 
Um, yeah, I've had so many other things that have been crowding my emails too. Um, here it is. Okay, let me bring it up first and then I'll share a screen. Okay. Let's go full screen. Yep. Did your active nature of the instruction? Okay. Code. All right. Now back to no, I can't go full screen because I can't find. All right. By the way, Susan, did you happen to mention in your introduction of yourself that you're a direct descendant, like X number of generations back of the Hugh <laughs> de Payen, who was the the leader of the first crusade? He founded the Knights Templar. And founded the Knights Templars. Yes. Well, Muslims wouldn't like that. <laughs> no. no. So part of the reason I'm uh, for uh, justice, because uh, I have a heritage I need to correct. <laughs> All right. Share screen. Now, that heritage was not directly attributed to your ancestors, but the people who came after them. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah I'm Catholic, guys. Easy does it. Whoops. All right. Exactly. Everybody see this okay? No. Has started sharing, started a screen share. Oh, there oh, we there go. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Okay, here we go. Due to the eruptive nature of the destruction process of the World Trade Center, the ground zero model assumes a... You make it louder. ...the oppression of the charge of an egg shape. Start it over if you would and make it louder. Granite. You can read it. Uh, well, but it's still, it'd be nice to hear it. The World Trade Center, the ground I'm trying to find how I can make it louder. Namely, a pressure discharge of Is a shaped doing structure it? of liquefied and highly pressurized granite. Yeah, if you could start over now that it's louder. But how's the volume? How's the volume? How's the it's volume? a little better. It's better. Okay. I'll turn up a little more. Due to the eruptive nature of the destruction process of the World Trade Center, the Ground Zero model assumes a single source event, namely a pressure discharge of an egg-shaped structure of liquefied and highly pressurized granite situated at 75. Uh-oh, the sound went away. There's no sound. I can read it. Can you hear us, Sue? But this is, uh, if we have a problem with it, we can, uh, you can each watch it uh, on your own uh, computers and you know, with good sound quality and be able to move through it. But yeah, no sound. It's strange. The sound was fine at the beginning. Yeah. And we can hear each other. Eruption. After the final explosion or reaction peak, this warhole seals itself for a few seconds due to the friction of the upshooting melt on the cold walls, simply because the melt in the warhole cools down, getting first viscous and finally solid. However, the trapped energy already in motion tries to get out. By direct impacts of the atomic nuclear bumping into each other, energy is transferred upwards. Simultaneously, this constitutes an effective self-cleaning process radioactive nuclear from the fission process will stay at the reaction center. Erupting upper working gases are clean. The eruption lasts only seconds. The eruption channel seals itself immediately due to the side pressure of the surrounding viscous granite. Radioactive contamination stays underground while the site stays hot for many months. Radioisotopes, if present at all above ground, are trapped and therefore masked in the iron-rich dust. The Geiger counter remains silent. 
Well, I think I make this again with my slides. So we have a more precise uh, source for this. I try. My sister, mother, and grandmother. Okay, is this visible? Not quite yet. Now it is. All right. Time is given at the uh, at the upper left. So we at nine a.m. and we have four points of interest A, B, C, D. So you have the small final pit floor, which is in the blueprint, <coughs> which is uh, guaranteed to be there. B is the supposed borehole, which is only 0 0.5 meters in diameter, so quite small. And Z is the first charge, I named this colors of point of emplacement, which is 50 meters below the final pit floor. And we have the explosion point, uh, 19 meters lower, which is exactly at the elevation zero. So you have to understand that elevation zero for the entire structure is an imaginary point in the granite 75 meters below this uh, below this granite surface. So the entire tower is built from this reference point elevation zero. And all the heights given in the blueprints are in, rela in relation to elevation zero. So you have the, the pit, A, you have the borehole, B, you have the the, the engine, the, the reactor starting, the startup one hour, hour prior to, to the destruction, and you have the, the point of explosion. And the, um, the, uh, the uh, potholes, the, the, the three glacier potholes Lawrence mentioned, uh, Valley 1, 2, and 3, are, uh, are, are drawn in here. You see the excavation as a size comparison, but they are too far away for the process to be involved, at least for tower, well, for, for tower two, obviously. So this is now uh, for tower. James, could, could I ask that we can see that the drill hole or borehole does not go all the way down to zero point, elevation zero. Why is that? And it's The borehole is to uh, elevation 19. I know. Why not all the way down to D? I come to that immediately. Okay. So next slide is well. I hope this works. Yes. So this is nine thirteen. So this is about ten minutes after activation, and you see the the idea is that we have a radiation weapon at first, so a reactor mix, not a bomb but a slow progressive energy input. And I found a nice video sequence which shows like the lava, hot lava burns through ice, creating a sort of funnel in the ice. It is exactly the same thing if at the reactor core of boiling uranium boils with 3,000, 4,000 degrees, it funnels down. Just and simple to the fact that uranium, if we have, let's say 30 kilograms of that stuff, which would be that size, that in that in size, small in a lemon, uh, it would, due to its due to its weight, funnel down, and the granite has no much resistance. So this is nine thirteen, and at the same time you have a strong X ray emission in this borehole. Should water be inside this borehole, as um, as uh, Rodriguez met, pointed out, there was a lot of water in, in, in the sub-basement as the sprinkler system was working. The water would boil and through the steam bubbles, radiation would nonetheless escape in the tower and weaken the iron structure. So you have a radiation weapon going on, so to speak, 913. And it burns its way down, well, one hour. So now we are at the destruction moment or at the explosion moment where the, the uranium becomes supercritical due to, due to the fact that it meets with the zero box at zero point. So you have a combination of two charges. Another possibility, 
perspective would be that something like thorium is just cooking out, boiling out, and somehow supercriticality is achieved at zero, uh, at, at point zero. So explosion time is in this model at 9.58, and the chain reaction starts. However, the system is enclosed in granite. So normally you have an explosion time of a microsecond, let's say, or 10 microseconds, um, which is well, 10 millionth of a second, then it's over in it. the Hiroshima bomb disintegrated and only 1% of the fuel was spent. That's a fact. Um, so now you have a system which is fully enclosed and cannot explode. So, the, this, so the, 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 the chain reaction does not abruptly stop, especially if you have an iron shell. Iron is also penetrated by hot uranium like a, a knife cutting through hot butter. Um, the, the iron shell guarantees that neutrons, escaping neutrons, are reflected and return into the center of reaction. Uh, so this explosion will continue as long as neutron flux is high enough. So you don't have a reaction or explosion time from one micro or 10 microseconds, but up to one second as long as neutron flux is high enough, and any physicist will confirm that. Heinz, it's an iron shell of what? A shell of what? Uh, no, a shell of iron. You have a, a, an iron housing. The a element housing iron is an, an iron excellent housing. neutron reflector. So the uranium chain reaction starts the neutrons go off in all direction and they are lost if they are not reflected. So you need some sort of reflect, re reflector to, 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 to get them back into the core. You know, I understand. Where is that iron shell? Um, is well, it at the... In this model, it's sitting down there. It's sitting in which, which place? At zero point? At, zero, or... at point zero, the black, the black square. Uh -huh. That's the iron. Okay, so, so you're saying that there was something at the point zero before the whole process started? Yes. Okay. Or at least at, 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 at elevation 19, which is slide one, which is the end kind of point of emplacement, which was activated. So a nuclear process was started at this elevation. Right. My question was, I understand that, but was at the time that the nuclear process began at point C, was there already something at point D that it reached eventually? This is possible. So uh, I have two possibilities, that I have a mix at point Z, which evaporates another strange, another metal, for, for example, thorium, which evaporates, with, which separates uh, because of its different boiling point and the mixture gets super critical after some time, after one hour, after one and a half hour, reaching approximately elevation zero. Or the second possibility is that a second charge was waiting, a second block of uranium waiting to be combined with the first one. Which would have to have been placed before the construction of the towers if the well doesn't go down that far. Uh well, yes, yes. I'd like to point out to Jane, if you notice, elevation zero was actually in the blueprints. Yeah, that's that's correct. That's very important. Yeah, it, this 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 is a very important point because everything is referring to elevation zero, and for a physicist, it makes totally sense. I continue with the presentation. So the reactor core is boiling down. After one hour and a lot of energy input already, the system explodes, but it's not a, an explosion like an atomic bomb. It's rather a, a very soft explosion, which can last up to one second, let's say, as long as neutron flux is high enough uh, to continue the, with the chain reaction, any physicist will uh, confirm that. So then under normal conditions, um, a sphere would form with radius uh, r equal to 25 meters. This is to scale in respect to the south tower. But we have an open borehole and we have something, we have a cooler blue cap, so to speak, the melt cap, which will shoot upwards. <clears throat> the water ball, the water 
no, the, 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 the borehole is now filled with water and this, the, the, the blue melt cap cannot shoot out like a bullet, but it has to rise. And this is the, the, the exact moment where the magic filter occurs. So due to the friction on the cold walls, the borehole at 100 uh, degrees Celsius in contact with the melt uh, will cool this melt down and it will solidify. It will get viscous and then solid and seal the hole. This is three seconds after explosion. And the trapped energy, the melt is already in motion and tries to get out. So we have not the normal process which uh, Lawrence described first, that suddenly a sphere is, is, is created, but we have a starting sphere which, had, which already has its way up defined and is reaching this, but it cannot break out because it's suddenly sealed. And this sudden seal guarantees that the, um, that the melt has a preferred direction of propagation. This is very important. Now, the filtering process, there's something you can ask any physicist, if I can just show this. This is the Newton's cradle. You see that? Do you see this? Yeah. yeah. This principle is valid for Newton's cradle, the momentum transfer. It's also valid for billiard balls. And it's also valid for nuclear, for, for atomic nuclei. So if one incoming nuclear hits another nuclei, the incoming nuclear is stopped and the energy is transferred to the other nuclei, which is above. And if you have many atomic nucleus hitting each other and with a preferred direction of propagation, energy is transferred upwards, but not the radioactive nuclei, which are contaminated. They stay below. So you have the, 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 the granite, which is suddenly transformed into a hot pressurized gas without radioactive contamination. This should be clear during this session. So <clears throat> then you have this disruptive egg. You have, by the way, a, a chopper signal which which has which shows certain blackouts which is which coincides with the uh, with the happenings underground and this radioactive well this eruptive egg is growing and it's reaching finally the seal so after breaking the, after breaking the seal eruption can start this is 10 seconds after the main reaction and this coincides with the seismic shock waves, which we observe. What, what seal? Could you point out where the seal is you're referring to? The seal is the 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 material which was shooting up and cooling down and then stopped the, the system. So I, I go back to the 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 the, the reactor. So we have here uh, already an, an a huge energy input from the reactor itself. The tower is already weakened due to radiation, which is received from from from, from below. And the, the borehole acts also as a vertical X-ray collimator. So radiation is poured into the tower. And my view is that the steel was molten, not by incendiary, but, but by radiation-induced um, thermal instability. So uh, the, the, the upper blue melt cap you see in this reactor will shoot up. Uh, and that's the cooler part, and it will go into the borehole, and the borehole is filled with water. And you have friction at the walls, and the blue material here now is shooting up. You see the blue material is shooting up, all is in motion two seconds after, and three seconds afterwards, the system will be sealed because it, it becomes because the melt cools down. What's shooting up, it cools down and stops the movement, the eruption. All right. And now the egg can 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 grow, and now can uh, the eruption start? And this creates a very curious phenomenon. So, if you have a focused pressure discharge of such an of such clean working gases, air is sucked from the surrounding area into the tower, and that was observed as a matter of fact. <clears throat> so you have material is shooting up and the working the working speed of the gases I've calculated to be 100 meters per second 
And very curious now is, is now that's the last, now that's the best, all right? That's very interesting. And it's, uh, forgive me for the word, it's a physicist's joke because the, the whole system is an exercise in the vertical throw. If you have an eruption speed with 100 meters per second, the material will rise due to gravity exactly to the, to the inch, to the roof top line. And then it will stop, it will reach the apex and will fall down again. So the whole system is calculated from zero point in the blueprints to elevate to, well, in this case, 500 meters to stop at the roof line and to come down. So you're, so, you're telling us, I believe that the zero point being the core of the whole plan yeah, was actually exactly. selected the depth was selected precisely so that it would reach just the roof line exactly exactly oh my god uh, i i was i was wondering why the roof line was lowered a few meters uh, at the early at the early plans and I, and i expected a physicist joke and I calculated this joke, well, that's, that's the, the, the handwriting of the colleague, so to speak, the physicist's joke. I, I calculated the standstill with the normal G value of 9.81, which is the yeah. average. And I was disappointed to get 520 meters in height about uh, something about this. And uh, suddenly it struck me that New York City might have a very, very specific value. And I got it. On Wikipedia, which is nine eight nine point eight zero two, and it fits to the inch. So it's a really, it's a, it's a real joke of a physicist. The vertical throw, and now you can explain also how the destruction worked because if you have mass shooting up to the roof line, it's accumulating, and suddenly the system will be inverted. So you have more mass accumulating in top. And this will start to fall like a wrecking ball. At the same moment, you have still with falling pressure, the eruption gas is shooting up. And where they meet, where the wrecking ball meets, already in free fall, and the still up shooting gases, the tower will be ripped, will be ripped apart, and the steel grid will be torn apart segment by segment. And that's one of the main errors the architects and engineers always say that we have seen explosives, a wave of explosives traveling down, top down. This is not the case. What we have seen is the pyrocrastic flow, the avalanche from above, meeting with the working gases, shooting upwards. And at the deviation zone, the structure, the outer steel grid is destroyed and it falls together with the tower. And what Lawrence just said, of course, if you see the entire structure, a bit of caving in is makes absolutely sense um, because the eruption channel will widen with uh, within a few seconds. So you have a narrow focused eruption in the first two seconds through the elevator through the elevator pit pit uh, freight elevator fifty, and it will widen a few meters until the the uh, system is sealed by the side pressure. So you will not have the uh, entire content spilled out, the radioactive contamination, but only the upper part of the clean eruptive egg will be emptied. Then the side pressure of the granite walls will seal and close again. Also during pressure discharge, the egg will cool down uh, a natural process. And as soon as, um, 2,000 degrees are reached, uh, the, the working gases can recondense. So you have to choose a very carefully calculated erupting, erupting point because this, uh, this sort of energy transfer via the atomic nuclear will happen only if the mix is about 5,000 degrees hot and about 200 bars, that's, that's a value from the literature. So at these temperatures, of course, the inner core is evaporated immediately. Molybdena also at 4,000 degrees is evaporated and, you and these small iron and metallic droplets are formed. They recondense in shape, forming in small spheres. 
all this has been observed, including the uh, the 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 this the air sucked in, and uh, all everything falls into place. So we have everything together: the enormous energy amount. We have the observed dynamics. We have the destruction of the inner core. We have the destruction of the the outer steel grid. Uh, we have also an explanation for the extremely low readings uh, in respect to the radioactivity. We have also an explanation for the cancer cases on place because something of course did escape. Also, it must be said that beta radiation is, is trapped in iron, so it cannot be trapped easily with a Geiger, it cannot be detected easily with a Geiger counter. Altogether, um, it's a pity that architects and engineers does not take into account that beta activity was in fact, and that's also a fact, a documented fact, slightly elev elevated about twice the background level. They said this is too low to be, uh, um, to be taken into account. And exactly that's one of the most grotious errors they, they, they committed. It must be taken into account. And well, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, let's open it up to questions. I'll let you go about eight minutes, nine minutes over. <laughs> um, got a question. I've got a question. I got one. Good. All right. So Susan, you're uh, the moderator. You need to start directing. Yep. Yeah, um, that was Barbara first. Okay. Okay, Heinz. A um, couple of questions came to my mind. Three questions. Um, the first, and I'll say them all because they're quick. Um, the first one is, um, given your model, is it could it be important that they locked the um, the roof doors of the towers? Uh, that's number one, which they did. Um, they they made the decision to lock them on September 11th on September 10th. Yeah, so that's, that's no. number one. No. No, no. Yeah, their decision. I, I, in my view, that's poor cruelty. Okay, because, so it's a coincidence as far as your model, though. Well, it, it has nothing to do with the model. So okay. locking the doors is just uh, to have the people roasted inside. Yeah, I okay. apologize. Um, well, the reason given um, was that, of course, it it doesn't it doesn't hold water, um, but the reason they gave after the fact. The, the officials in New York City was that they wanted to uh, make sure that the helicopters didn't come over because the heat and rising smoke was too much and it could, you know, the helicopters uh, would be in danger. Um, my next question is, this is, this is very compelling, but it's also very complicated. And it seems to me that no one would ever do this without having tested it other places. Do you agree? Um, well, yes and no. Um, just just imagine you have you have something you need you need sixty kilogram of uranium to make this process work. Okay, that's not much. That's uh, two two oranges or two grapefruits in size. And. Um, what you what what you need is not an entire steel structure like the World Trade Center, four hundred meters high, to test it. But you have to 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 understand how the ground reacts, and that's pretty easy. So you have to drill your hole at seventy five meters or, or or fifty meters. You have to place your charge. You have to place it, your second charge, or, or or make sure that the first mix get super critical after say 19 meters and then you have to look how how high rises the fountain the resulting erupting fountain 400 meters 500 meters 300 meters and how much contamination is in the air and with that you can already build a simple model how this will work in a, on a bigger structure it was oh, no a, i understand that i wasn't proposing that I mean, there wasn't another structure similar to this that they could have tested it on. I didn't mean that they would have practiced or tested it on a very high structure, just that they would have had to have tested the procedure underground um, probably multiple times someplace on the planet in advance. Yeah, well, I must I myself now 
I, 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 well, as a physicist, I'm, I'm, I'm making a small model of the World Trade Center, one, one meter fifty, just to, to play a bit with the, with the resulting pressure, pressure waves, um, lowering a weight from, from above and having a fire, fire device from below and a metallic cladding of my small tower just to see how it works. Well, the principle is, is pretty easy. And uh, if you are working in the field, and I want, I really want to stress this, this is a physicist's game. And one of the, one of the big, huge mistakes is that the architects and engineers see this as a riddle which they have to solve. That's not their task. It's a physicist's game and the physicists have to explain and to solve this. Um, and they have to help the, uh, the architects and engineers, but you need many, you have to consult with many, many physicists, because if you, have, if you consult only with one or two, most probably you will get the answer, this is impossible. But if you consult 100, five out of them will say, well, that's interesting. And you have to find these people. And well, it makes yeah. sense. To me, it makes absolutely sense. Okay, thank you. And Jane, you had a question? Yes. Um, are you saying that this process would be was available for both one and two? Uh, absolutely. And what all what also um, puzzled me, or well, puzzled yes, which is a giveaway that we have so similar structures, and the energy output. Of the North Tower was ex well twice as much actually. The quake was uh, two point uh, three, so twice as, as as much as the the uh, the South Tower, given the log logarithmic scale with two point one. And um, the destruction dynamics of the North Tower was, <sighs> while the South Tower just feebly collapsed in itself at the beginning. So the energy output of the North Tower destruction was above ground, much higher. And I'd always wondered where did this imprecision come from? If you have two identical towers and if you have two identical, two identical devices, bombs, let's say, and two identical uh, depth of burial, uh, then you must have very, very, very similar this destruction patterns, but it turned out that there is a huge march of difference. I mean, both towers were destroyed in the same fashion, but uh, nonetheless, the North Tower was blown apart completely, while the South Tower feebly collapsed in itself, comparatively. Okay. So what did okay. you come up with to explain the difference? Oh. Uh, just just in a model uh, this model has um, if it works accurately it it is it is a process which starts but which cannot be stopped and which has a lot of let's say uh, variations uh, a lot of possibilities to go wrong mm. or, or at least or at least differently mm -hmm. and my view is that building seven uh, the destruction of Building 7 was done by a similar but not identical process because we have three major quakes uh, this day, uh, one for the North Tower, one for the South Tower, and at 11, there's another quake. And my suspicion is that World Trade Center 7 was planned for 11 o'clock a.m., but something did go wrong. So they had to, to send some special... Some, some some other troops to 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 bring it down finally to give him the yeah. final knock so to speak. Yeah, that's why Shapiro has gone public saying that he talked to Silverstein, and that he didn't say at eleven o'clock um, there was a significant destruction at the lower level, but it's obvious that uh, in the afternoon um, Silverstein was saying, well, we're going to have to bring it down because um, the the lower structure has already been so seriously damaged. They, 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 they had it. They, had, they, of course. Well, it, it was impossible to, 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 to leave it standing. 
Yes. Uh, okay, because, I'm not done because with my if question, you have though, if you have you know. a, a, a nuclear process going on, which is roasting the the building and destroying the steel structure itself during hours, so the, the entire columns will get feeble and and weak, and the the building was ready to fall. So okay. a radiation weapon. Uh, so, let me ask you something. The, the the ones that were doing a lot of asbestos abatement on the buildings was Turner Construction Company. It's a subsidiary of a company out of Germany called H-O-C-H-T-I-E-F. You probably are aware of it because it's the largest construction company in Germany. Are you aware of that company? Uh, no. Okay. What, who would be who would have the capability of performing this? Would it be a government or could it be a construction company that's large enough? You know, a uh, it, it, or could it? I mean, who who has the capability to do this? In respect to what exactly now? To the to the access to the materials. Uh, I mean, uh, drilling a borehole wouldn't be hard. But uranium is just not available to everybody. No, uh, I mean the, um, I mean uh, who was capable of of doing such a job of destruction? I mean, construction companies or demolition companies. Did they have access no, to no, those no, no, material? No, no. This is this is a a sort of this is a very strange collusion between many many powers. So you have something governmental there. You have some and something private. And um, um, well, Rockefeller owned the whole. No, Rockefeller started the whole process, and um, and uh, the narrative of the terrorist attack was given by Ehud Barak on this, the, the, the the very same day. And the more you look at it, you have one side is the Mossad which is heavily involved in destruction, but it was not only the Mossad. You have also the CIA, you have some components of the of the uh, of the Rockefellers and um, and well the the entire apparatus of the government is highly complicit of the United States apparatus is highly complicit in all this, uh, not to speak uh, of the cover up. And then there's well, also wait, wait, wait a minute, Barb, I'm not done. Okay, uh, sorry. we had a we were studying the anthrax too and it seems like we're kind of focused on a private company there as well even though they do jobs for the cia which was battelle so yeah you're right private and gov government and private companies work together yeah uh, but absolutely. getting uranium is uranium that available to private companies as well or just a few no uh well this is um a collusion between private interests and and and, and uh, governmental interests. Finally, it was to shape a new world order, not only by some private corporation, but the the military was behind it. Some special branch of the military. Yeah, I'd like to. I believe. I'd like to make a comment here, um, and that is that um, maybe Heinz, you can. For people who aren't aware of it, the importance of um, of this being involved with the uh, elevator, the service elevator 50, because it was the only one that went all the way from the bottom to the top of the tower. That's number one. And number two, um, it was um, leading up to 9-11 for many, many months. There was a, a so-called elevator renovation project exactly, yeah. by ACE, AC Elevator company or ace company which was also um ace ace company was also i believe ace is a is a british company i'm not certain i, I think I recall it was a that. company that was thrown together real quick from yeah. uh, people from other companies oh you mean ace was yeah it wasn't it wasn't one of the big boys in LA. okay well well that that makes sense because okay. they would use that umbrella to bring together all of the operators they needed to collude to do this. Um, the CIA and creates companies and then they go away. Well, and exactly. Then dissolve. exactly. And ACE was also involved at the Pentagon. Well, in, in respect to, to the nuclear plasma shooting up at 5,000 or 4,000 degrees, nothing can stop stop such, such, uh, such a gas flow except 
gases are or, 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 so um if the elevator would have been blocked in the middle so to speak the gas flow would have been deviated and cut the tower in half so it is necessary that the the material can shoot up to the roof line relatively unhindered of course it will evaporate on its way uh, all obstacles but as a gas flow it should have a smooth way up and I think it was the elevator fortification, the elevator renovation, which allowed this. Oh. And also uh, auxiliary explosions in the surrounding elevator shafts because one elevator alone, one elevator alone is a bit too small. So they, they prepared the building with normal explosives, which were heard all day or, or one hour in the building. Before and it now the, the asbestos abatement uh, project was going on for years, and that was Turner Construction. And they, they're a subsidiary of this German company, H-O-C-H-T-I-E-F uh, of Germany. It's your largest construction company in Germany. So that they were a subsidiary of that, and they were doing the ab asbestos abatement. Now, ACE was doing the elevators, but they were also, and the asbestos was all over the buildings. Yeah. Yeah, so they had plenty of access to everywhere. They, they had, they had. Yeah. All right. I, I would like to let people know that I have, I am right now, as I'm speaking to you, uh, starting on the fourth of the month, this is now the seventh, I'm in a back and forth by phone and email uh, with a an eyewitness who personally um, wired up the uh, the elevator shafts on the outside of the elevator shafts, and uh, Richard Gage knows about this. Um, I'm going back and forth. I'm taking careful notes. I just typed them up, um, wow. and um, I'm speaking. Well, let's not talk about that now. Well, you don't know about that, Jane. I know, but we but we really need to stick to his his discussion right now. Well, it, it's just relevant to who has access to the tower, Cecil. Yeah. Uh, Lorenzo had his hand up. You're muted. Lorenzo? Uh, this just has to do with some fundamental physics. And essentially, uh, one of the, the fundamental rules of, rules of physics is high pressure always goes to low. Uh, well, uh, high pressure always well, depends what high pressure is. So if we, if we, um, high pressure always will try to, to escape to the weakest point. And it's elementary physics, yes. But um, you have to nonetheless distinguish between a process where the nuclei are racing around in matter so through solid matter, which is the growth of the egg, where this sphere or the egg can grow within a few seconds, 25 meters, 50 meters, and a normal gas pressure discharge where the atom is already an atom and has found its shell. So your allegation is that somehow this elevator shaft, or let's just say the core structure of uh, each of the twin towers, became a pressure vessel that allowed this pressure to go all the way to the top. No, 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 no. The, the pressure discharge like a jet was already freed in the final pit floor. So in the final pit of freight elevator 17 and just raised up. It, it's like a huge volcano eruption. You can really see it as a volcano eruption. Well, don't, you did, don't go you in elevator chef 50, didn't you? So we do not speak about uh, some some pressure tight uh, tube four hundred meters high which transport the 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 material in in into the top. No 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 no. It goes straight through everything which 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 meets resistance. That answer your question? Um, not satisfactorily, but it is an answer. Do you want to follow up? No, I'll just let this go. Okay. 
Are we recording this, I hope, so that we could yes. study the recording later? Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. All right. Um, Alan. I had uh, questions. Um, now, you mentioned the iron spheres shielding the uh, emissions in the dust. Um, now, in a lot of um, this dust, I don't see any discussion of the uh, different uh, isotopes of the different elements, per se. Uh, you know, when they refer to thorium, we're just, what isotope is it? Uh, you know, I know that, um, did they analyze any of that material um, to differentiate between something that may have been in the melted granite as a, uh, a primordial um, natural product and something that was anthro. Uh, all right, you know. yeah. First of all, it should be, uh, well, you should know that private companies, labs were forbidden by threat of the loss of their license to analyze the dust by themselves. The USGS was permitted, but not on site, but only in the surroundings. The USGS did find some, well, suspicious, uh, iso no, some, some suspicious elements, but without specifying the isotopes. And with this, even though I also 10 years ago thought, wow, so much uranium, so much fission byproducts possible but and uh, generally speaking the usgs analysis of the dust without giving the the radioisotopes and the exact atomic number is pretty much useless because um you cannot distinguish between the different isotopes of one element it was not given and in respect to uh, the uh, research of Dr. Loy, which is often cited, uh, which is the core publication and which mentions the activated beta activity twice the background level or uh, radio cesium activity less than 1000 becquerel uh, per kilogram, which is fairly high, which is, which is uh, 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 a, well, um, a no-go actually. Because the level in Germany, the for radio cesium in food is six hundred, so you have uh, so you have some 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 margin you can play with, but but a thoroughly analysis was not made, and you have to prove in the ground if you bore down to seventy five meters. Uh, if anything is important to to take home with this lecture today, is that you have to prove in the ground. If you bore deep enough, and uh, it will be there for thousands of years. Would you have to bore down uh, under elevator shaft 50? Exactly. Exactly in the center and about, well, 75 meters 50, it will start already. 75, up to 100 even. So that would be under for each, for each of the current, that would be under the pools. Uh, of course, no. you can point. see you can see the pools as a radiation shield. I always saw the 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 pools at radi as a radiation shield. Curiously enough, there were three pools. So we have three towers destroyed, and the Silverstein, the 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 the, 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 the small pool at the old World Trade Center Seven site um, seems insignificant, but it's curiously exactly over the hot spot. Where the reported collapse began and all the heat input was. So, in my view, Building Seven was roasted by a radiation device, so to speak, in the granite. And uh, the new Building Seven is much slimmer, much smaller. And over the hotspot now at Building Seven is the small pool in the Silverstein Family Park. Irony of of the situation. And of course, the memorial pools, which are much bigger, but also represent, in my point of view, effective radiation shield because water shields everything from below. 
No. Indeed. Wow. This this was quite a professional job, wasn't it? Oh yeah. It, it is, yes. It's, it's 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 interesting to see the cunning and the malevolence and the knowledge and the professionalism all coming together. So it's 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 really a bit upsetting, and it's also the reason why I'm so infuriated and was just spending hours and hours, thousands of hours in unmaking this riddle. Uh, you're 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 honorable for that. We've all been doing years and years of yep. this. That's true. <clears throat> wow. in, in your opinion, um, I know you're saying private and public, um, but there, there has to be specialists that know how to handle this. So it would have to be um, some of the, it would have to be some of the military and I, you know, the military's fine, but there's not, they're not all brain scientists, <laughs> you know, uh, so there's got to be certain units that could be involved with this, but we're not just talking about one country here. We're talking about more than one country. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it um, might be self-defeating to try and answer all the questions about who done it, who was involved. Well, we know certain people that wouldn't be able to do this so you know you have right. to kind of sh i mean uh, if we're ever going to get to court on this we've got to be able well, to try to focus on a, a, a certain soon. direction well you can however you can narrow this down if if this job was a nuclear in nature you can really narrow it down to a very small group of organizations and people yes. Absolutely. and and one of the uh, tale telling things is indeed uh, the question, who told us the false narrative? And there we have all the figures and all the names and who shipped the steel and, and who were in, in, the, in, in the knots of the control points. Well, it, 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 there are people, where, and we know the names, who can answer a lot of questions. Yeah, I'd like to remind people, and this, is, this quote is, um, is in my documentary, Behind the Smoke Curtain, um, and that is that uh, David Rockefeller, um, there's a quote from David Rockefeller uh, to the effect, um, uh, he said, uh, you know, I've been, I've been, uh, uh, it's been said of me that, uh, that, that I'm, um, you know, conspiring for a global world order. And, and he's um, proud of it. And he's proud of it. He said, well, I would, you know, wear that as a badge of honor. And this is the person, you know, when you ask yourself, is it, is it beyond the realm of possibility that um, the towers were built in the first place and perhaps some of the other buildings, but certainly the towers um, with the uh, with in mind to bring them down? Yeah, that's that's, appropriate... that's my opinion. That's my opinion. And you have also this strange and well, ugly jokes placed around. I, I in in the book, the Ground Zero model. I I I've you know, on page one hundred thirty three. I don't know if you, I don't know if you are familiar with the joke. Gutless men carried it out. The exposition directly. I placed this here. It was actually a sort of mannequin puppet carrying a sort of coffin. Um, a nine eleven art project, which was placed which was on site uh, the day uh, on 9-11. So they have, they have their jokes. They have their own jokes with this story. Um, uh, also the arts artist and uh, which got permission from an organization which was presided by Rockefeller. So a lot of ugly jokes actually are accompanying this, uh, not to mention even the, 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 all the movies who predicted a uh, destruction of the World Trade Center by planes or nearly destruction. There are plenty of examples. Yes. Bad taste. Heinz, can I ask you a question? You got yes. two books in Amazon and the one you're talking about today is Ground Zero Model. Uh, I see that. Uh, there's another yeah. one here. All the oligarchs' nu nuclear war games uh, is the, does that relate to 9/11? It looks like it does. So it, that's also another. It is, but that. but the ground zero model, you know, 
if you are looking for an answer for, uh, for about 10 years, you make mistakes. And um, my former publications, they are not free from mistakes. And I'm still working a bit on the ground zero model. Well, the ground zero model is pretty fixed now. It's pretty stable, but I have small corrections. This book I showed you is, so to, so to speak, up to date. Okay. On you. Okay. Heinz, do you and and the, the second one, the oligarchs, nuclear war games, is that a separate? No, the oligarchs, nuclear war game is my, my, my code name, so to speak. Um, it's a second edition of the Ground Zero model. It's, it says. It's... Um, uh, well, I've I've some 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 subject on my mind uh, on the surrounding philosophy of all this, okay. uh, which goes deep into fascistic ideas, and to expose them, because these ideas of world domination are not new, but uh, well, that's true. sometimes they frap us unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, okay. I did want to get back to the um evidence you know that's what you need in court and not too much hypothesis well that's, that's why i'm saying why susan that that's a small world in right. the nuclear business evidence. The, nuclear, the, the nuclear business not everybody's in that that business right. well, very few. i have three points evidence evidence so yeah. first you have the evidence on ground zero, on point zero, or at point zero, 75 meters underground. So and that's in the blueprint. No, so what we need is core samples. Well, that's that's the first. You have the evidence and you have them for thousands of years. Second, if you connect with the physicists and ask them, make this sense, if they are pressed, they will admit yes. So how, if you imagine you have all the explosives in the world, how can you make a tower erupt like this? How can you make the air being sucked into? How can you create also all sorts of skin cancers, letting alone asbestos, which are good as an explanation for lung cancers, but uh, does not cover all? Um, so you have so many. Uh, ready answers in the destruction of, in the dynamics of the destruction in the observed phenomena that any physicist or a lot of physicists if pressed will sign you a document that the ground zero model is very close to the truth mm. but only if pressed if you ask one or two randomly you find always people who say who cry out no no radioactivity so impossible there's no possibility to have a nuclear process without having uh, uh, a clear radioactive fingerprint. And they're dismissing the fact that every nuclear reactor at home or in the next city is doing exactly the same. So producing energy out of a fission process with an effective filtering system. And the filtering system is explained. This is the, the riddle of 9-11. Where is the radioactive fingerprint? As soon as you are capable of explaining the filtering process in the granite, underground, and the clean erupting gases, you have one, basically. And we are now at this level. We need to prove it. The damage is from the beta radiation. The damage, the damage to the lungs and to the people is beta radiation, correct? Well, my colleague, uh, an, uh, another idea. Uh, well, I was talking about uh, the, the, the samples and the destruction dynamics. My colleague, Francois Roby, which is a, who is a French professor of physics, um, calculated the energy uh, involved in the cooling process and the energy alone gives all the process away because if you have a three month cooling period, all the tower should have been consisted of, 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 of carbon or some burnable material of coal because the, the input of energy was immense. No way that uh, uh, any classical incendiary could have produced, could have produced such amounts of energy. Totally okay. concur. 
So you, you see architects and engineers focus on destruction, 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 but they do not calculate the energy which was emanated, emanating three months afterwards. And we have to sum it all up. So the radiation input at the start, the destruction process, the energy, and most important of all, the energy of the cooling down process. Just they poured millions of gallons of water in and, this, and the stuff evaporated for months. Yep. So, so beta beta uh, radiation would not be apparent with with measuring equipment, and that's what could be causing the the damage to the first response. Wait, 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 wait. wait. So, if you take a cheap Geiger counter, and you have beta radiation isotopes trapped in microsphere, in iron, in iron microsphere or metallic microsphere, the, the uh, Geiger counter will show no signal. Okay. If you okay. inhale the dust and it comes in contact with salty body fluids or with uh, stomach acid, the metallic microspheres will dissolve and the, uh, the isotopes, the radioactivity can 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 be absorbed by your body and cause harm everywhere. So for a proper analysis, you should have dissolved the dust in boiling sulfuric acid and then measuring it with a scintillation uh, device. So the, the, the method applied by Dr. Loy and his team simply putting some dust into the counter in the scintillation uh, device is not a correct one. And I was told that by a lab manager in Germany. Mm. Wow. I can see that causation being a problem though. <laughs> being difficult. What do you mean, Jane? So you didn't well, I mean, that. in law, you have, uh, you have to prove causation to link an injury to an event. Oh. Uh, and uh, that would be a difficult causation to link, I believe. <clears throat> Maybe. Well, as as a matter of fact, I was always I was always surprised, or it was always a suspicion for me, a, a sort of proof, uh, an an non understandable proof. So we have no radioactivity measured by the official documents. But we have cancers, cancers as if radioactivity were on place and working. Correct. So, and it's also very important to understand that a short intake of some radioactive material is causes much less harm than a continuous intake of a small quantity over three months or six months. So it's the accumulated. Mm -hmm. accumulated amount of the radiation you you absorb in your body and you've said that it was the thyroid cancers that give the game away uh th thyroid also uh, peaked but uh well you have you have other cancers as well yes mm -hmm. but i thought the thyroid cancers were the critical well they 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 peaked they peaked in the first month and that's uh, when when iodine um when iodine is active, iodine has a pretty rapid decay time, a half-life. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm. So a thyroid, thyroid cancer, you can expect it to, to, to peak in the first year, and then other cancers will, will take their part and will grow. Well, I think it took them five months or more to get this place halfway cleaned up. Yeah. So I estimate I estimate that about 100 millisievert as a dose were received, and that dose causes cancer in 10 percent of the irradiated people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Well, guys, it's going to take me. Thank you so much. Half the night to download and upload this uh, recording, so. Um, I, I'd it's like 9-11. It's 9-11. Yes. <laughs> hey, so I've got to go, guys. It's 9-11. <laughs> yeah, we're ending at 9-11. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Heinz, so very much. Lots of Thank good, you, Larry. good information yeah. and questions. 
Um, uh, All right, Lawrence, I, I will, I will send you the files tomorrow. All right, thank you, uh, thank you, Hans. Thanks. Okay, and we look forward now, to the link to the video. Are are we going to have this other gentleman on Barbara that you've been talking to that uh, has oh, a similar? Only, well, as as I've explained to you in emails today, Jane, um, he's not willing to do that yet. Okay. 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 But I'm, I'm, it's my job to get him to say yes. So um, <laughs> I, th I think this crowd would, he would be interested, uh, he would be able to explain it to them better. Yeah, yeah his yeah. name is Per Berglund. And um, Heinz, are you familiar with his model? Uh, who? Per, P E R Berglund of Sweden. Uh, I already, ma I already mailed you. Uh, oh. Yes. Um, well, you didn't get the mail because um, there was uh, it was rejected. Actually, I know Per Berglund. Yes, he has another idea, and he was a bit furious about me because I insisted on my gas pressure chamber. He is on the other camp, so to speak. He believes in a very sophisticated nuclear weapon of some futuristic design, which I do not. Right. Yeah. At some point, hopefully, we can have the two of you on to dis discuss the pros and cons. But if you could send me that email again, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I, I've asked Jeff Prager to, to, to forward it to you. Oh, well, I'll I try again tomorrow. I wonder, did it say why it didn't go through? Uh, it was suspected to be a spam mail. Oh, you mean you mean I might have gotten it, in, but it's in spam? No, 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 no. It was rejected automatically. Oh, okay. We'll try again. <laughs> We all had trouble with Barbara's email for some reason. <laughs> we don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't mine in this case. It was, it was. <clears throat> oh, well. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Lauren. 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 Thank you, Before we go, before we go, when do we yeah. want to do this again? Tuesday. Just send us... Uh, you know, we need two weeks to absorb things. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to get we need to get the video and have a quite a while to to review it again. I, I, I need to get Heinz's book so I can understand better. Yeah, I've read yeah. Heinz's book. And but... and I sent you the latest slides already. Yes, we've got I can do so again. You sent to who? Just to Sue? No, to uh, I got him. I got him. Oh, okay. I'll send him again the whole package. Okay. Uh, so, I don't so, know that I have. When did, when did you send it, Heinz? I've got it. I'll send well, it to you. I, one day ago. So. Yeah. Okay, I don't think I have that. All right. Thanks for forwarding it, Jane. Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll send it to you, Barbara. Thank you. Okay, okay. good night, everybody. Good night, good night everyone. Night. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.